Speaking of those foreign conflicts, Crystal, let's move on to Israel. Yeah, so we've got a lot to update you on here. Let's put this per- first piece up on the screen, which is probably the most significant. Israel's national security advisor just announced he expects Israel's military operations in Gaza to continue through at least the end of the year. Appearing to dismiss, the New York Times writes, the idea that the war could come to an end after the military offensive against Hamas in Rafah. Quote, we expect another seven months of combat in order to shore up our achievement and realize what we define as the destruction of Hamas and Islamic Jihad's military and governing capabilities. Emily, there's been a lot of discussion about how Netanyahu has every incentive to keep this war going, zero incentive to end the war. Um, He himself has benefited politically. His numbers are still not great, but they're actually sort of coming back up, ticking back up post-October 7th because some of the outrage and the horror at the fact that October 7th happened on his watch in spite of him being Mr. Security, some of that has faded away and there's been a bit of a rally around the flag effect. So his numbers have started to tick back up and he also has continued corruption charges hanging over his head that he's gonna have to reckon with too whenever this war ends. So a lot has justifiably been made of how he has every incentive to keep this thing going, but many others do as well. Anyone who was in any position of power on October 7th um, has an incentive to you know, keep, keep it going so there's no reckoning with the failures that occurred in the security and intelligence establishment in Israel on that day. And anyone who's had a hand in the the horrific prosecution of this war has an incentive to keep it going because in, in spite of them talking here, Emily, about, you know, we need to shore up our achievement, our victory, whatever, there has been really no achievement. There has been no victory unless you just define that as total and complete annihilation. Hamas is being able to reconstitute. They're being able to recruit thousands of new fighters. There's still something like uh, 60% of the tunnel network that is still uh, operable. The, you, you have hostages who are still being held, who are being killed, by the way, by the IDF, the longer that this goes on. So uh, in terms of providing security for Israelis, in terms of the purported goal of quote unquote destroying Hamas, which was always impossible, um, they've basically gotten nowhere over these many months. And so everyone who's been involved in this war has every incentive in the world to keep it going, to avoid a reckoning with what an incredible failure this has been, even from an Israeli point of view. Yeah, I mean, talk about the potential for a quagmire. I mean, what's happening right now, just bulldozing, uh, turning into a parking lot, the swath of land creating so many refugees, the humanitarian crisis as a response from a kind of realist foreign policy perspective. And I know you and Sakhar have talked about this. I mean, it doesn't even... Ryan and I talked about this yesterday. Does it make the Israeli people safer? No. In in the long term? No. Because if this goal is the unattainable ambition of, quote, annihilating Hamas and the way the war has been prosecuted so far, if you take those two things and have your primary benefactor, the United States of America, say they support a two-state solution and your own Prime Minister Netanyahu saying, absolutely not. We support a one-state solution. These are not compatible partners for a war, uh, even though the United States continues to be a partner or try to be a partner to Netanyahu. Um, None of it makes sense. None of it makes sense for any, like, peace resolution Mm -hmm. imminently that would stop death and destruction that would make the people of Israel safer. And, you know, I guess I feel like it's kind of a luxury, personally, to be over here and not over there and, you know, get to sort of analyze it. I understand uh, where Israelis are coming from. Um, it's a it's a horrible situation, but this is not making anybody safer in the long term. It's just obviously not making anybody safer. Yeah. Anyone who I think is looking at this objectively has to say that from the beginning. I mean, it's not to justify any sort of extremism, but your mother, brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, whoever that you love and close to, murdered in a horrific way, babies incinerated in tents. How do you that you think that's going to, you know, stoke your heart for, for peace and love towards the Israelis? Of course not. Of course not. And so that's why we even have U.S. intelligence officials saying, hey, Hamas has been able to recruit thousands of people just in the past several months, mm-hmm. even under conditions of war. So, um, you know, just a dramatic failure even from an Israeli perspective, putting aside, obviously, the, you know, horror and the immorality and the fact, too, that Israel at this point is almost completely isolated in the world. The U.S. is increasingly isolated in the world. Now, we're better able to withstand it because we are still a superpower, although, you know, multipolarity is increasingly the reality in the world. We're we're accelerating that shift to multipolarity. 
with the, you know, obvious hypocrisy that we've displayed in disregard for our purported concern for humanitarianism and international law, et cetera. But, um, you know, for Israel, there there will be uh, some sort of reckoning. And for this uh, government, there will be some sort of a reckoning at some point. We just don't know when. At the same time, it's becoming more and more difficult to defend things like, again, babies being incinerated inside of tents where they've been displaced to in a purported, in a place that they thought was a safe zone. Um, but Joe Scarborough is doing his best. He's having to go back and rewrite history and, uh, you know, claim that actually we won the Vietnam and the Iraq wars in <laughs> order to somehow defend the Israeli actions here. Let's take a listen to what he had to say recently. What is Israel to do? Are, are they supposed to just sit there while conditions in Rafah get worse, while the, the possibility of famine spreads, and while Hamas... Regroups. The, I, I, I mean, I, let's just state the obvious. The United States would never do this. We didn't do this in Mosul. We didn't do this in Afghanistan. We didn't do this in Iraq. We didn't do this in Vietnam. We didn't do this in World War II. If we were struck, we struck back until we won the war. So I, I, I guess what, what confuses me is, what is it? Is it in the United States or Israel's best interest that Israel just sits outside of Rafa and this suffering continues indefinitely, or do they go in and kill Hamas terrorists? There is so much about that that drives me insane. I mean, first of all, he oh they just sit back and let people suffer. No, they are causing the suffering. The starvation isn't just happening. They're blocking the aid. And aid has dropped something like 60% since they invaded Rafa, by the way. And you already had people who were starving to death. That's number one. Obviously, the claim that we won in Iraq and Vietnam or that our approach there was great for us or great for the world is utterly preposterous. But, you know, that's where we are now, that they have to try to rewrite history. And also, there's been this weird thing, Emily, I'm sure you've probably tracked this as well, of people who are saying like, well, actually compared to our, the horrors and war crimes we did, Israel is great. It's like, first of all, is that really your standard? And second of all, compare, listen, I was a huge and am a huge Iraq war critic. The number of civilians that we slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, horrific, unacceptable. No one should be losing, using that as their standard. However, Compared to the civilian death rate in Gaza right now, we look like angels. We look like the most moral army on the planet compared to what's going on there. And even in Mosul, which he brings up, I, I looked at it. Again, huge, massive, uh, indefensible slaughter in Mosul. 10,000 civilians killed for to get roughly 4,000 ISIS fighters. That is a uh, ratio of 70% killed worse civilians. Again, I think that is wholly unacceptable. The ratio in Gaza is worse. Now, we don't know the exact figures, but even with a generous reading, it's roughly 80% civilians who've been killed and it, many more, 35,000, 36,000, 46,000 when you count those buried under the rubble, probably many more when you count starvation, illness, disease, et cetera, who've been killed in a very short time period. So it's just layers of outrageous absurdity, rewriting history, et cetera. Well, rewriting history, and I'm, I'm chuckling while we're talking about this horrible, tragic situation because Mika Brzezinski's father is obviously one of the most famous key Cold Warriors. Yeah. So when you have Joe Scarborough mentioning Mosul, mentioning Vietnam, he's sitting next to the daughter of, a, again, like one of the most notorious Cold Warriors, and I would say not in a good way. I mean, he bragged about... Uh, being the sort of brains behind the idea in the Carter administration to start funding the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Mm. I mean, this goes back back decades, wow. and I think it speaks to how entrenched the foreign policy establishment is in defending 50 years of failed policy. Have you seen any of the clips, though, of uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Mika's dad, lecturing Joe on uh, Israel? I have not. Oh, <laughs> Should I'm I? gonna send you some things because <laughs> there, there are. There's at least one interview where he just goes in on Joe. He's like, honestly, your understanding of this conflict is embarrassing, and because Joe has all the basically like the Hillary Clinton version of events in terms of the peace negotiations, mm. that it was like all you know in Oslo, that it was all one sided, sure. it was all the Palestinians walking away, 
And uh, anyway, Mika's dad really puts him in his place in a way that is quite remarkable. So I, I highly recommend you check out those clips because they are quite quite enjoyable. Um, I just referenced something that's, that's worth digging into more. Again, we really don't know exactly what the death toll is in Gaza, but there's a lot of talk about because it's the health ministry, which is uh, Hamas controlled, quote unquote, that perhaps the death toll is being overstated. There are a lot increasing numbers of experts who are stay, saying it's much more likely that it's actually being understated. Let's put this up on the screen. This is from Haaretz, again, Israeli newspaper. This is a, an opinion piece from a number of experts that we, three different experts that we, or two different experts that we have here. They say why Gaza's death toll is probably higher than reported, the scope of the killing as well as the incidence of illness and deaths due to lack of basic sanitary conditions, food, medical care, demand an urgent public debate in Israel. Um, they go on to write here, the fatality numbers in the Gaza Strip over the past seven months are appalling. According to the UN, over 34,000 people have been killed, over 77,000 wounded, another 11,000 trapped under the rubble considered missing. But this is just part of the picture. We believe the morbidity and fatality numbers in Gaza are actually higher. Our conclusion is based on comparisons with the public health challenges in refugee camps immediately after the 1948 war and familiarity with epidemiological data in general. We believe that the scope of the killing, as well as the incidence of illness and deaths due to a lack of basic sanitary conditions, food and medical care, demand an urgent public debate in Israel. Um, some of the things that they note here is that according, again, to the UN, around 31% of kids under two in northern Gaza and around 10% in Rafah suffering from severe malnourishment. And we've had yet another massive aid cut um, with the failure of the freaking pier, but also more significantly with the closure of the Rafah crossing. Numbers of dead due to starvation, they say, are not yet known. Clear many people are suffering irreversible damage. People who subsist on weeds and livestock feed for months will not survive long. And Emily, they compare it to the response to uh, the Nakba in 1948 and the um, you know provisions that were provided for refugees at that time, the huge concern about the spread of disease, the provisioning of you know significant amounts of food and water and aid in that way as well, and they're saying they're not doing anything close to what was do being done even in 1948, which was also a horror. And we know that there were huge numbers of deaths that resulted from those unsanitary conditions at the time. So one can only imagine what is happening right now. Yeah, and that's I think an important point in of itself that we actually really don't know. We really, like, the the uh, full extent, the scope of what's happening. Yeah. Someone mentioned this uh, the other day. We actually didn't have a death count out of Dresden, like an official death count out of Dresden until, I don't know, like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, something crazy like that. It took years to put the, uh, to, to get, like, a final figure that people were comfortable with. And so that can go in both directions. And so because we don't know, you hear a lot of people who are supportive of the incursion into Rafa saying, well, we just, we don't know what the death toll has been so far. You know, we, the IDF says it's doing everything to minimize civilian casualties, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, there's a lot of, I think, significant um, reason to believe that we are missing deaths, uh, that people are under the rubble, that, you know, there's just, there, there's so much destruction that we're missing uh, the the full extent of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, for all the, the, for all the conversations about potentially overcounting, I really, even as, again, someone who has generally been, you know, not necessarily since October 7th, but before that, generally pro-Israel, I look at this, and I, I, th I think people are really missing a big part of the picture. Because you asked the question, too, I mean, even people who have chronic illnesses and they, you know, can't get their insulin yep. or, um, you know, early on in the conflict, we had numbers coming out about huge spike. I think it was like by 100 times the number of kids who were suffering from severe diarrhea, which is one of the leading causes of death for children around the world. So that's not some little thing. You have a hospital and healthcare system that is just decimated. I mean, it's, it is really um, doesn't even hardly function at this point. It's unbelievable what these doctors and nurses are able to do. There's in one hospital in Rafa right now. They've closed other hospitals, there's one remaining hospital functioning right now. So in that context, how would you even have any idea who is sick, who is dying, what it's a result from? And are people who are, say, dying from starvation or dying from a lack of, you know, the medicine they need for, for chronic long-term conditions? Or there are no cancer hospitals operative in Gaza anymore. Who's know. maimed for life? Right, like who's who's that's right. Will never be the same because they lost a leg, they lost an arm, they lost an eye. Yeah. I don't think anyone in Gaza will ever be the same. 
Certainly. You know, yeah, certainly in a certain true. sense, I don't think anyone will ever be the same. So um, in any case, this will be, you know, one of the, the long-term reckonings of this war is exactly what was the death toll, because I don't think we have any idea right now. There's one other significant piece of military news. This is something to track really closely. Put this up on the screen. The IDF has announced that they've taken control of that uh, border with Egypt, the Gaza-Egypt border, right there near Rafa. Um, you know, this is a very fraught situation. We brought you earlier this week, Sagar and I covered that at least one Egyptian soldier had been killed in an exchange of fire with the IDF. You have the Egyptian government, which, you know, in spite of whatever rhetoric they might use, is, you know, very pro-Israel. They get tons of money from us and they do what we want. That's basically the bottom line ever since Camp David with regards to Egypt. Population, on the other hand, feels a very different way, very sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. And so you have these Egyptian soldiers right there on the border who are seeing, you know, the, the horrors that are being inflicted in Rafah right now. And uh, also interesting, Emily, that the, uh, according to Ken Klippenstein, mm. the Israeli government won't talk at all about what happened in that exchange of fire that led to one Egyptian soldier being killed. So this is, um, you know, part of why the dealings with Egypt are incredibly fraught and, um, you know, really significant to track. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the peer, the, the death of the Egyptian, I mean, this week has been a rolling disaster for the Biden administration and their position on the, the conflict, their attempt to uh, publicly walk a fine line for the politics of the conflict. It it's almost defies uh, believability, yeah. like how bad this last week has been specifically. Hey, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show, ad-free and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right. Get the full show. Help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.